are joining from different parts of the world. I welcome uh, Her Excellency, Mrs. Nona Depre, all our panelists, our audience who have joined us for this important session, which is closing plenary session on addressing non-traditional security challenges between European Union and South Asia. And as uh, we have seen that over the last two days, there have been deliberations on traditional security issues, on cooperation between South Asia and European Union. However, when we talk about non-traditional security issues or non-conventional security issues, they have become very, very prominent uh, over the last uh, couple of years or a decade. However, in contemporary times, I would say that they have taken uh, eminence over the traditional security issues because there has been a continuing interlinkage between these two. Well, I'll be sharing very briefly my views a little later in the webinar. Now I invite uh, Her Excellency, Mrs. Nona Jeffrey, Ambassador of Education of European Union Nepal to share views. Over to you, Ambassador. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Bar. Um, namaste. Good morning, good afternoon to all. I am Nona Dupre, I'm the ambassador of the European Union to Nepal. So based in Kathmandu and as such also observer to the General Secretary of SARC. Thank you very much to the organizers, the Asian Institute for Diplomacy and International Affairs and the South Asia Democratic Forum for organizing these debates. I am very honored to address such an excellent panel and warm welcome to the audience. Um, there are so many non-traditional security challenges for the moment that I will really stick to those that I know best. So um, as we navigate really through these very uncharted and, and unpredictable waters, and we are living in a more and more contested and global world uh, with so many so-called non-traditional security challenges coming to the forefront um, and where the, the natural tendency of each group uh, in terms of uh, in in times of crisis, would be to more to be more inward looking. I am really truly proud of the stance that European Union has taken in the face of this pandemic, and will continue to pursue. Um, we go for multilateralism, for cooperation, for solidarity, um, as we have all asserted that no country is safe until all countries are, and that global responses must really show us the way to recovery. We are in this world which is hit by the pandemic and characterized by power politics. And I am very proud that the EU defends an effective rules-based multilateral order to ensure also that every human being can enjoy the security and the rights that we sometimes take for granted. Um, multilateralism and diplomacy, they will continue to play a key role in tackling this pandemic. And it will also promote increased trust and cooperation. And these are fundamental pillars for the global response to these shared non-traditional security challenges. Um, you know that at the be beginning of the pandemic, there was no funding nor global framework for a vaccine. And the European Union has stepped up to lead the global response um, to help raise funding, to finance research, tests and tr treatments uh, for the whole world. With the current uh, new uh, first uh, vaccine announcements, we are beginning to see the light at the end of this tunnel. But however, with the progress comes also the risks of vaccine nationalism. From the start, we as EU have clearly chosen for a multilateral approach. And this needs to become the global choice. Um, because also a restart of the global economy hinges on all countries having access to vaccines, regardless of their level of income. Um, another risk is also, we, we have already seen this, we have seen the mask diplomacy in early 2020, um, where some countries link access to medical treatment, to political compliance and urgence. And this is again where we want to stand up and we say that vaccines are not bargaining chips and they have to be treated as global public goods and distributed without discrimination based on medical needs. 
And for this, it is really important that we team up with partners, including business and civil society around the world. So we need to continue working in a collaborative and multilateral way, bringing also the researchers, companies and countries all together. And we need to equip WHO with the tools to manage the next, the upcoming health challenges. So today we have vaccines. However, since the beginning of the pandemic, there has also been a huge volume of misleading information and blatant conspiracy theories about vaccines. Um, this infodemic, uh, which has accompanied the global pandemic, um, is, is a true security threat. Uh, we have seen how widespread and how damaging foreign interference and disinformation can be for security, for the democracy, and for our societies. And during the pandemic, the fight against mis- and disinformation has also been used by authoritarian regimes as a pretext to limit fundamental rights and especially freedom of expression and freedom of the media. More generally, there is, of course, an ongoing battle of narratives. Um, it is normal that countries and political leaders explain their positions and portray themselves in a favorable light. Um, but some actors go beyond that, and they present their ways of addressing global challenges as the only effective one, while attempting at the same time also to discredit others. So some foreign actors, be they state or non-state, even engage in disinformation campaigns, deliberately spreading false or misleading information. And they do so to weaken us and to harm our ability to respond to crisis effectively. This is not new, but it has been exacerbated now. Um, what I also, we also need to increase international cooperation there because there are no borders in cyberspace. Um, the internal attempts that the EU could have to protect ourselves from these threats internally, they can be undermined by manipulative interference launched from countries with weaker regulatory and monitoring capacities. So for this also, we need to define a rule book on digital economy and society, on data, on the use of big data, on infrastructure, on security, the relations with online platforms, their behaviors has an impact on our security, on our democracy, the data need to be protected. This requires rules without of course affecting free speech. Um, so this is also a very important part where we have rules for operating in, in Europe that could be a model for others that are confronted of course with the same challenges. And then lastly, we also of course need to prepare need to improve our preparedness to pandemics. And we have to use this crisis to improve our pre preparedness to pandemics at the global level. And the scientists have warned us for years that destruction of habitats increases the likelihood of zoonotic transfers, in turn leading to pandemics. So this is really also the moment to build back better, to fight climate change together, to protect the environment and biodiversity, to promote sustainable development and sustainable connectivity. Um, and this is not only about climate change. A green recovery is not only about climate change. The pandemic has reminded us of links between the environmental degradation and the impacts of human health. Air needs to stay cleaner and biodiversity loss needs to stop. Um, and this, this scarcity of resources, we see it, this is very important in, in this region, in South Asia, um, water security, climate change, uh, this region is particularly vulnerable to this. This will lead to more crisis, more conflict, more inequalities, and this will destabilize uh, societies, destabilize democracies, and also destabilize economic development and economic growth. And this requires really cooperation, regional cooperation, global cooperation, because these are global challenges um, and they can only be tackled and overcome through global and coordinated action. And I will leave it at this and I am very much looking forward to the presentations by the panel. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Her Excellency, uh, for setting the tone.
for today's uh, webinar. Well, uh, you highlighted some very pertinent points. One, of course, uh, the pandemic actually binds us together all the more, and we need to further collaborate and cooperate um, in diverse issues, whether it's health or environment or climate change. And also two other important issues. One is, of course, uh, the issue of rights. Uh, I think it's across the democracies uh, that rights are actually taken for granted. I think it's very critical because rights, again, has a broad connotation. It talks about your right to a decent life, which include uh, life free from pollution, free from repercussions of the climate change, human security, the wider definition. Well, uh, I'll just quickly uh, highlight two important points to set the tone for the for the deliberation, as you have already set the tone for today's webinar. One, of course, when we talk about the whole idea of non-traditional issues, then it's more kind of a comprehensive security that we are talking about, including organized crime, terrorism, environmental issues, and of course, the issues of food security, the issue of migration, which is very, very critical. Uh, and the second important issue is about the Indo-Pacific region. Since um, Indo-Pacific region uh, presently is seen as a kind of the global strategic maritime and economic kind of a powerhouse with a geostrategic dimension. But it in this region, we also have very other pertinent issues, including the maritime security and of course the economics, but also the issue of the organized crime in terms of piracy. So I think this is some other area in which we can further collaborate. Uh, and as far as um, uh, I would say in India and uh, or South Asia, rather the broad South Asia and uh, of course European Union, then I, can, I think they can be further, uh, further rising to the potential which we have not achieved uh, here in South Asia itself in terms of regional cooperation, as well as between South Asia and European Union in terms of sharing our expertise or um, uh, European Union's uh, experience in technology, which can also be a, a kind of an in instrument in further development in this area. And the third issue, which I like to quickly highlight is that uh, when we talk about traditional security issues, then traditional security issues uh, are not, uh, they cannot be divided, they can be, cannot be channelized in some kind of a watertight compartment because ultimately, whether it's European Union or whether it's South Asia, somewhere down the line, traditional issues and non-traditional issues, they actually uh, intertwine. Because when we have uh, problems like climate change or uh, food security issues or the scarcity issues, which ultimately may create uh, environmental refugees, may result in migrations or the water wars as, as has been predicted, um, storms, desertification, um, organized crimes, and so many other issues, then it also has repercussions on the political relations. It also has repercussions in terms of transboundary conflicts, political instability. So I think it's all the more pertinent that in today's uh, uh, webinar and also in the near future, uh, we think about how uh, to further enhance our cooperation in these areas in order to manage these conflicts that uh, we actually are facing right now. And of course, pandemic actually highlights how intertwined, how interlinked the world is and how interlinked these issues are. So I think uh, with that, uh, I would like for the deliberations on these issues, which are eminent experts that we have in today's panel, they will be actually highlighting. And since we have such eminent uh, panelists today, we look forward to very interesting and engaging deliberations. Uh, well, first of all, we have uh, Dr. Khan Ahmed Sayyid Mushid. Uh, he's Director General from Bangladesh Institute of Development Studies. So Dr. Khan, uh, I think uh, over to you. Uh, we'll be very keen to hear your views on the issue. Uh, Ma'am, uh, Dr. Khan is it as well. Okay, let me go to the you. next speaker. Sure, yeah. yeah. Okay, fine. Then, then we have Mr. Sabisachi Datta. He is the founder director of Asian Conference, uh, Shillong, India. So, over to you, uh, Dr. Datta. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I'm I'm actually in a in a car in the middle of the city, 
because uh, I had running late from another meeting. So uh, excuse me if, uh, if there's some ambient noise. Um, it's not uh, it's not easy to be the first speaker in such a um, in such a erudite panel, but I take my cues from the uh, tone set by uh, Ambassador Deprez uh, on uh, on the issues that present to us uh, in today's world, uh, as we are all uh, coming out of of, of COVID. Uh, the vaccines are just coming out. We're trying to see the uh, light at the end of the tunnel. I think it's a time for all of us uh, to reflect on what we have learned and what is the next step forward. Um, one major learning is that um, uh, we never, we never, the world never anticipated this virus, and it is, it was a non-traditional. Uh, security threat that posed itself to all of us, and we are still reeling under it. Um, the chair has uh, pointed out uh, uh, several uh, several points, uh, uh, which are uh, which are contributing uh, and which can be done. Uh, as far as I am concerned, in my in my brief uh, intervention today, I would like to um, to limit myself to three or four points um, uh, on on the subject. And, uh, but be before I do that, I'd also like to uh, lay a perspective of where I'm coming from. Um, Asian Confluence is a think tank. Uh, we uh, are located in the Northeastern uh, region of India. Uh, we share borders with uh, as many as five countries, uh, which are very nearby. Uh, and um, we are very close. Uh, we, are, we are a region which is uh, very ecologically um, tied together beyond borders. Um, I like to say that we all together in South Asia, at least in Eastern South Asia, which I'm talking about in this context, um, is uh, we are a mountain to sea ecosystem. You know, we are connected by air, water, um, uh, the biodiversity, uh, the flow of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, it's a contiguous flow, um, of the natural flow of land and water. Uh, uh, which defines the geography. And uh, therefore, since time immemorial, people uh, and uh, living beings, uh, animals have moved across this region seamlessly. But in recent, uh, in the last uh, few, uh, um, you know, uh, half a century or a little more than that, we have seen an increasingly uh, fragmented uh, region. Uh, there was, of course, the partition uh, then followed by the um, several uh, issues at the borders. And now uh, it is a region which is very, very less integrated. Um, and uh, as we today deliberate on uh, especially this very important theme of how EU and uh, the region can uh, learn from each other, collaborate uh, in an increasingly uh, intertwined world, uh, the question that foremost comes to my mind is um, do we really appreciate the role of multilateralism enough? <clears throat> and I think in this context, um, uh, the learnings from you, uh, which has stood up against all the odds in recent times as a multilateral functioning multilateral institution, um, stood up with some uh, true values of multilateralism. I think these, there are enormous learnings for us. Um, and uh, uh, therefore, I would like to, um, uh, beyond the pandemic, uh, uh, coming out of the pandemic, I'd like to say three points, which is one, I think we in Southeast, South Asia, and especially I'll confine my remarks to what we call the BBIN region, Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Nepal region, which is uh, nearby. So I'll let a context to that. Um, we all together need to work uh, to meet the, the existing non-traditional security threats that we all acknowledge, uh, such as climate change, uh, uh, water scarcity, uh, human security arising from uh, 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 food security, etc. cetera, um, to, uh, to work for a green recovery in the post-COVID times. And to work towards a green recovery, I think uh, the role of uh, adequate uh, 
water management, um, agriculture management, those narratives and discourses need to be uh, really underscored and highlighted because the narrative of cooperation uh, in this region is so far still very much, uh, uh, you know, not so much in these lines. Um, so um, that would be my, my first point. Uh, a green recovery, here also learnings uh, from the EU, uh, the technical expertise from the EU, um, building trust amongst the nations on these new avenues. You know, we have a region which has many, many little discords on um, uh, trade, um, trading issues, um, uh, the, uh, the tariffs <laughs> across borders, uh, the logistics across borders. So there, are, there is a trust deficit that exists. But I think we can leapfrog that, that by thinking of new ways and new models in which we can build new industries, such as in the agri sector, uh, towards a green recovery. My second point would be that um, I think uh, security and diplomacy uh, in the current times cannot only be left uh, to the domain of think tanks, academia, and the diplomats and the government. I think people in general have to understand that we are in an inter increasingly interconnected world. Uh, we, need, we depend on each other. Uh, and there is a huge gap and a huge role for public education and public awareness towards that end. What does the common man in the last mile, how does he in, 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 in Bhutan or in, or in Bangladesh or in Nepal or in, in, in India, uh, look at the neighbor? Uh, what is the narrative that we are emerging out of that? I think here, um, learnings from the EU on how people have benefited uh, across borders, um, through open borders, the value of open borders, um, the value of uh, seamless movements. Um, <clears throat> I think those need to be underscored. Um, <clears throat> the, the third point and the final point I would like to raise is the role of media and uh, think tanks like us um, and the academia in narrative building and public education. And again, here, I think uh, uh, more uh, exchanges such as this, this particular forum um, uh, that uh, has happened, uh, plus um, growing a network of think tanks between EU and the region uh, towards uh, better uh, uh, creating more intellectual components, uh, better narrative building towards better trust building um, better propagation of uh, technical knowledge um, should be uh, should be promoted, and I think everybody needs to uh, to play their part. Um, I think these things will also lead when people understand this on these three pronged approach. I think the the uh, the looming clouds of uh, uh, the issues raised due to uh, forced migration or um, uh, you know uh, uh, disasters or even uh, you know, uh, things like uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, non-traditional things like uh, what we are witnessing today, those could be better dealt with. Uh, so I think uh, the future belongs to more and more collaborations. Um, a, a little, uh, my final note will be, you know, uh, the European Union in my limited uh, understanding, um, whatever interactions I've had with, uh, with Europe, people from Europe, you know, they are, we are very, uh, um, uh, let's get it done. Uh, it's a very pragmatic approach. Here in South Asia, there is a little more appreciation for the chaos. We like chaos in this part of the world, you know. So how do we, how do we blend uh, the technical know-how, the dissemination of this knowledge, uh, the dealing with each other um, in the true spirit of, of the DNA of the two regions? That I think needs to be worked on. And more people to people exchanges, more exchanges, more interactions, I think would be the way forward. So on that note, um, thank you for uh, giving the opportunity for, uh, uh, for uh, uh, placing a few views. And I look forward to hearing from my co-panelists. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Dutta, for, hiding, uh, for highlighting certain uh, pertinent points. Well, especially when you uh, spoke about the whole idea of uh, education and creating awareness for the collaboration 
between think tanks and academia, both in uh, South Asia and uh, European Union. I think that's very critical in terms of not only uh, further interactions, but also in terms of exchange of views and learning from each other. So that's uh, very critical. And also, of course, people to people contact. And uh, just just a couple of um, observations, two points you highlighted, one of course about uh, uh, how South Asia is is different in terms of dealing with certain things. Well, that also comes because of the whole idea of the region or the or the historical background that the two regions or the difference in the history that we have. Because European Union is more kind of a supranational organization, and here in South Asia, uh, the cooperation more is in terms of functional cooperation. So uh, that that actually highlights the difference. And uh, so since you spoke about uh, BBIN, well, absolutely, since in South Asia, uh, we could not go uh, further in terms of a regional approach through SAR, then sub-regional cooperation is a way out and we have been working on that. BBIN is one example and of course being stuck actually uh, binds both South countries in South Asia and Southeast Asia. So that's another area. And uh, when we talk about uh, BBIN or when you spoke about uh, Northeast India or the neighboring countries, then it's very pertinent because if you look at the Himalayan river basins, since you spoke about the environmental issues, then in Himalayan river basins, we are actually facing uh, the repercussions of the climate change or the melting of the ice uh, with the result that uh, water scarcity is actually uh, contributing to massive reduction in the production of rice, wheat, maize, and fish, impacting uh, both uh, in Nepal and India. So I think these are some of the issues that can be uh, further looked into and, of course, cooperation both at the regional and uh, learning from each other to EU and South Asia cooperation is definitely uh, one of the ways out. So uh, thank you again for your um, observations, uh, Mr. Dada. Well, going back to the next speaker, uh, next we have uh, Dr. Emma Hakala. She's a senior research fellow in Finnish Institute of International Affairs, Finland. So looking forward to um, hearing your views. And I understand that you'll be speaking on uh, environmental issues and also migration. So over to you, Dr. Hakara. Thank you so much. And, and thank you for the opportunity to, to join this panel. This has been really interesting and, and uh, I'm, I'm really thankful to be involved. Um, yes, I actually have a, a PowerPoint presentation. So let's see if I can manage to share it with you uh, and uh, can you see it now okay good um yes uh, i don't want to be too somehow pedagogic or anything about it but i thought that uh it might be useful because we are talking about something that is kind of uh, somehow very difficult to grasp these non-traditional security challenges so I thought that it maybe makes sense to look at one challenge a bit more in detail and and think about how it's actually how it affects and what it then means for security thinking, for example. And because my own uh, expertise is on climate change, I thought that we can maybe look at that in more detail. Also, of course, because climate change is a huge development which affects us all uh, and has really um, kind of various uh, consequences. So I think it then covers also maybe some of the uh, other non-traditional security challenges and, and kind of gives an idea of what they are like as a whole. Um, so in general, I would say that, that the threats connected to climate change are very complex, of course, and they also tend to be um, slow onset, which means that they, they kind of uh, take place um, or they evolve uh, very uh, slowly. So you don't kind of recognize them until it's, it's often maybe too late even. And they also tend to be cascading so that they uh, sort of accumulate uh, and kind of reinforce each other and are also linked to external factors. So they, uh, it's often not just about some um, storm, for example, associated with climate change, which, which already has very, uh, can have very uh, serious repercussions, but then that storm can also be uh, kind of linked and combined to other 
uh, issues and, and cause further harm through them in a way. Uh, and I'll talk about these linkages a bit more in detail in just a second. But what this means then is that uh, these uh, climate uh, change threats are very difficult to predict and to even observe and also then to pre prepare for and to prevent. And of course, that's something that we want to do if we want to sort of enhance our security. Um, and then uh, I, for myself, have kind of created this uh, categorization of, of climate related threats, uh, just because I think that because they are so varied and, and kind of take place at different levels and at different speeds and so on, uh, then it makes sense to have some kind of a structure to them. But of course, these categories that I will present uh, next, uh, they are not in any way like mutually exclusive and there is a lot of overlap between them. And they're also not like some kind of an official uh, categorization of climate security, but there are many different ways of thinking about this, uh, uh, these different kinds of, of threats. But let's see here. <clears throat> My categorization of uh, security impacts of climate change uh, is kind of three levels, uh, but I'm not sure if even levels is the best way of, of looking at it because they also kind of interact between the levels. Uh, so I would still uh, divide them into three different kinds of impacts. So local impacts, geopolitical impacts, and then structural impacts. And I will now try to explain a bit more in detail what I mean by them. So the local security impacts are maybe the, the, the ones that are the most obvious and that we often talk about. Um, they are direct and often kind of short term and limited geographically. So they are basically just the direct impacts of some specific uh, environmental disaster, for example, or, or then a longer ter term uh, process like a drought or, or something like that but they still are very serious. They pose a risk to life and health. Um, however, the good thing maybe about them, uh, if, if there's anything good, uh, is that they are in a way straightforward in the sense that uh, it is often possible to somehow adapt to them in advance or try to prevent them in different ways, like by building flood de defenses or then creating these early warning systems in order to make people uh, move from affected areas or so on. And some examples of these, uh, just to give you some idea, uh, would be, for example, increased flooding, uh, which is happening, I guess, already now in, in Bangladesh, and uh, then more intense droughts or even like long-term uh, droughts in, in different areas, for example, in Nepal or India or Pakistan. And there are many other examples, so uh, these are not the only ones, but just to give you some idea of what I mean by these. So that's still kind of maybe straightforward, but then um, we move on to geopolitical security impacts. Uh, and here I mean these kinds of impacts where the climate change or environmental change is combined with some kind of socioeconomic factors. And often these also um, tend to cross national borders. So there might be some event happening, uh, some again, maybe drought or some other, um, uh, other uh, threat in a way happening in, in one country, but then its implications are also felt by surrounding countries, for example. And in some cases, these, um, uh, these uh, impacts are then kind of cascaded very uh, like over very long distances even. So uh, this might be the case, for example, with uh, food security, uh, for example, uh, affecting world market markets and market prices of, uh, of different um, food stuffs, which can uh, also, especially uh, perhaps in poorer countries have some national security impacts and, and so on. Uh, but these are, still even though they are maybe a bit more vague somehow uh, to grasp what, what they are they still pose very big risks to societies and individuals so even kind of like um, disrupting uh, specific functions of a society as a whole like for example energy um, energy production or things like that 
And also what makes them kind of difficult to tackle, tackle is that their foresight and prevention is very difficult because not only do you have to kind of prevent uh, or foresee some uh, weather patterns and sort of climatic patterns, but then you would also have to combine them with uh, kind of knowledge about socioeconomic factors and their future development, which is very difficult. Uh, and then some examples again of, of this would be, for example, uh, forced migration to, due to flooding or marginalization and political upheaval due to droughts. So here you can see that these uh, sort of ecological factors also contribute to the societal and political factors. And then finally, um, perhaps most um, difficult one in a way to, to really understand would be these uh, structural security impacts. And by these, I mean the, the systemic disruptions which are caused by the mitigation and adaptation to climate change. So of course, this is something that we need to do uh, regardless of anything, we need to mitigate climate change. Uh, but the problem is that the challenge there is so huge that we need to um, do quite a lot and, and change even our societies and certain ways of producing things and, uh, and, and doing things and producing energy especially um, in ways that, that do um, mean uh, very big changes also in the society. And, and this can then um, kind of create these sort of winner and loser situations uh, within the societies, like between different groups of people, for example, and, and also between different country, countries, for example, in terms of energy production, there are currently countries that are very much relying on their fossil fuel production. Uh, whereas, at least if we uh, are able to uh, transform our energy use as we should, then of course those countries will be in facing some trouble due to the, the fact that they will not be able to rely on their uh, previous production so much. And these uh, structural security impacts can be global or local. Um, and again, they also uh, pose uh, risks to societies, but also individuals. Uh, and some examples of these might be uh, land grabbing as a result of uh, biofuels production, especially if it's done in an excessive way and um, and kind of not respecting the land rights of local people. Or then social inequality or political extremism uh, resulting from these sort of poorly planned decarbonization plans, where for example, people, people would have to pay very much for their energy and are not able to uh, pay it and then kind of turn towards this um, social unrest uh, as a result of that. Of course, these also often take place in a very long period of time. So it's not uh, just like overnight that people become radicalized, for example, but, uh, but there can be linkages can be seen between these developments. So then um, what do we need to do then with this uh, information or with this classification? Uh, I think that this shows that uh, climate security needs to go beyond traditional security. So of course, it's very clear that these uh, traditional security measures are not able to prevent either climate change or its impacts, and that can't be required from, from them. Uh, but then at the same time, we recognize that climate change clearly does pose risks to security. So what this then means is that we need to come up with some new practices and ways of thinking about security. And we also maybe need to include sort of new actors and, uh, and new, um, yeah, new actors in the security decision making, at least when it comes to these more non-traditional security threats. Um, of course, then there are still issues that go within the sort of very national security frame. And I'm not saying that this should be opened up to all the world, uh, but in some cases it may make sense to make security a bit more inclusive somehow. Uh, and then some of the, the more practical things that I, I think that an enhancement of climate security requires, and also these are things that that very much would contribute to better understanding and preventing other non-traditional security threats would be first 
further research, uh, especially on these geopolitical and structural impacts, uh, which are more difficult to detect. And I'm not just saying this because I'm a researcher, <laughs> but uh, also I think that we need a better understanding of what these uh, kind of more comprehensive impacts will be. Uh, then, as has already been pointed out in this panel, we need international cooperation uh, because, of course, these impacts are cross-border and global. And then also there is there are a lot of mutual benefits in kind of um, preventing and tackling them together rather than just alone. So I think this is a very key issue here. Um, then also we need to integrate climate change into all kinds of risk assessments and strategic planning. Uh, so that it's it's kind of taken into account as a real thing that is happening and, and having consequences and maybe also the prevention of climate change or the mitigation actions we need to increasingly understand what kinds of consequences they have on uh, security. Uh, then we need coordination between different level, levels of governance uh, from the national to the local and also the international. Uh, at least in, in Finland, uh, in my own research, I've found that there is a kind of a willingness to sort of integrate climate security concerns into these more practical actions uh, of different authorities, for example. Uh, but there isn't really enough coordination and understanding of the, the issue, really. So that still needs to be worked on. And then overall, we need a more kind of comprehensive and inclusive approach to planning when it comes to these environmental or climate security issues. And that actually is all from me. I hope I didn't take too much time. Um, but uh, yes, thank you very much. And uh, hopefully there will be a good discussion still. <laughs> well, uh, thank you, Dr. Emma. You are absolutely on time. And it was uh, quite an uh, interesting presentation. And a couple of issues that you highlighted in terms of uh, an inclusive approach, uh, in terms of coordination uh, between different levels of government, I think that's very critical and very important. Uh, well, I would say that uh, more kind of a coordination, not only between different levels of government, but different levels of governance internationally and nationally also. Uh, because, for example, if, if, if it's a democracy and we have different levels, a local level and a regional level and then a national level, you need uh, collaboration, cooperation between them uh, in order to implement or rather in order to initiate any kind of uh, policy, because it's very pertinent that we realize that climate change is real and it's actually happening and we need to deal with it. And it's, I would say it's already late, but we need to deal with it before it's too late. So I think that's very critical. And another thing which I would like to add here, Emma, which uh, is again very critical, that perhaps in terms of problems like environment or climate change, if we need to have a multiple layers of action, for example, we talk about international organizations, whether it's UN or, or WHO or European Union or SARC or any other organization or regional organization for that matter, that is one level of uh, uh, cooperation or coordination that can be done. The second is, of course, at the level of, and here, of course, Paris Peace Conference and other conferences will also come into the picture. The second at the national level, where we actually need to implement and bring about certain changes in the policies of the national government, because you need to implement at the national level, ultimately, whatever you commit at the international level. And the third, I would say that within the national, um, you have uh, the, uh, the local governance and other governance, fine. But at the individual level also, whatever we can do in terms of mitigating or managing the climate change, that's very critical. And here, uh, everyone's role, whether it's think tank or researchers or academia, or even we as, uh, as, as teachers or as students or, or, or as environmentalists, how we can contribute. So I think in terms of creating awareness or even a small thing that we do, uh, it does help, you know. And once you start this kind of a movement, then people do join, they do understand, and then, then the movement goes on. So I think that's very, very relevant. Thank you once again for highlighting these points, Dr. Emma, and I'm sure 
we are looking forward to a good discussion and i'll request all our participants to please write in the uh, chat box or q and section uh, session uh, i mean section q and uh, so that we can have a q and a session which is will be very very engaging here so uh, then i move on to the next uh, participant next we have uh, mr samir patel he is a fellow from gateway house india uh, looking forward to you mr samir over to you mr samir i'm looking forward to hearing you thank you uh, thank you dr chiba uh, hello and good evening from uh, mumbai uh, uh, thank you mr sham ji and sunil ji and uh, aidi team for giving me the opportunity to speak at this uh, august gathering i warmly recall the hospitality of the aidi team uh, during my first and only visit to kathmandu so far during the india nepal think tank summit uh, in 2018 Uh, so my co-panelists have already spoken about uh, various dimensions of security uh, i am actually going to uh, restrict my remarks to the issue of cyber security and how they figure in the south asia and the eu uh, ties now as her excellency ambassador uh, dipesh already mentioned in her remarks that perhaps one of the most uh, uh, unprecedented things to come out of the covid-19 pandemic and now the vaccine development and all the lockdowns was the development of this explosion of the conspiracy theories fake news and unsubstantiated data about the spread of virus and now with regard to the efficacy and side effects of the vaccines this was the epidemic and as she said infodemic that we were not prepared for so countering this uh, disinformation campaigns and conspiracy theories is the foremost uh, cyber security challenge that we face today where well, technology companies and the government are doing what they can uh, in targeting and removing such uh, contents as well as this uh, uh, data from the cyberspace what we urgently need to do is to increase the awareness and resilience among the population the citizens to withstand and counter such uh, disinformation campaigns and for this both europe and south asia need to teach their citizens about fake news reliability of media and sources and how best to identify what cause and because most of the internet users are attending i feel must begin in schools and engage responsibly in the cyberspace uh, second issue that i want to highlight is that of expanded threat vector of cyber attacks as we saw from the date uh, from the spate of data breaches uh, which happened a few weeks ago targeting the us government agencies and private companies cyber attacks today have become the new normal in the geopolitical ambitions and rivalries and in that sense 2020 the year that gone by was a peculiar one not just because of the covid-19 but also because of the significant increase in the cyber attacks at a time when the whole world was dealing with the covid-19 health emergency there were some actors and the rogue states which were busy finding opportunities to engage in offensive cyber operations this was evident from the multiple attacks targeting critical national infrastructure engaged in fighting the pandemic like the attacks against hospitals in europe and attacks against a pharmaceutical company in india and what these attacks clearly reveal is that some countries are using the cyber space to achieve their geopolitical objectives by taking advantage of the attribution problem few countries have the technical capabilities to uh, investigate the attack vectors and the route taken by the hackers to launch an attack the the european union has certainly better technical capability than many other countries particularly in this part of the world in the last few years india has also significantly upgraded its technical capabilities so this potentially can become one area of collaboration between the european union and uh, south asia third issue that i want to highlight is the rise of the dark net the hidden internet and the digital black markets places which sell prohibited goods such as drugs firearms uh, stolen personal and financial data illegal pornography counterfeit items malware and computer viruses and they offer services such as contract killing now this has really made the dark net the hubs of illegal online activity contributing to the growth in cyber crimes across the world in south asia we are still grappling with the financial and security implications of the dark net even as the organized criminal syndicates are 
expanding their presence on this hidden internet. Also, these online criminal activities have perpetuated the offline cross-border smuggling networks, which is a familiar security challenge in this part of the world. In recent years, European law enforcement agencies led by the Europol have made a sustained effort to take down these leading dark net marketplaces. And this has certainly contributed, at least in temporarily restricting these criminal activities. I say temporarily because one of the phenomena which is often evident in the field of cybersecurity is that as soon as one particular platform or a digital black market site is shut, in no time, new marketplaces, new platforms emerge. So clearly criminal gangs have shown the resilience which has sustained them beyond these security crackdowns. Therefore, countering the dark net, the digital black markets is another challenge for both EU as well as South Asia. And this is something on which both the regions can definitely work together. Certainly there is much more to learn from the Europol's experience in how it has gone about successfully targeting the digital black market places. And my fourth and last point is about the use of cyberspace by the terrorist groups, a challenge we are all too familiar with. Despite several steps taken by the law enforcement agencies along with the technology companies, terrorist and extremist groups continue to thrive in the cyberspace, adapting to the latest technological trends and the viral apps. Terrorist groups in this part of the world, such as lashkar e taiba and jaish e Mohammed, have used encryption technologies and messaging platforms like Telegram for radicalization, propaganda, and recruitment. Europe too has seen familiar instances where Daesh or the Islamic State-sponsored uh, or inspired lone wolves have used the cyberspace to execute the terrorist attacks. So counter-terrorism in the cyberspace is another area for cooperation between the EU and South Asia, which can really focus on countering the terrorist propaganda and choking the terrorist financing. That's my wish list for the EU-South Asia cooperation. I'll stop here and look forward to the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Samir, for um, highlighting um, critical issue of cybersecurity, uh, which actually is one of the areas where both European Union and South Asia can collaborate, uh, because it, it's a very, very uh, technical issue. And since technology is kind of a bane also, and it's a boon also, it's a boon for all of us because we can connect. For example, right now we are connecting even during the pandemic across the world, you know, sitting in different continents through technology. But at the same time, the same technology is available to the anti-social elements, the terrorists. So we have this very critical issue of national security uh, in terms of uh, organized crime. Uh, that's another dimension. When we talk about organized crime, we usually talk about terrorism and drug trafficking. But I think cybersecurity is a very, very critical element which, which all of us need to talk about. And when we talk about cybersecurity, cyber warfare is the new weapon that has come into the picture. And it's both organized crime by non-state actors as well as state actors. So that is another critical dimension that one has to look into. And finally, when we talk about cyber crime or cyber security, then even common masses, they get affected by it. We have online frauds and so many other issues. Then here comes the gender component because women are nowadays, they're actually facing the issue of the cyber bullying or cyber crimes. So I think, again, it has a multiple dimension and definitely uh, South Asia and European Union can collaborate on this issue. Rather, they should uh, coordinate and work on this very pertinent issue. So thank you, Mr. Samil. We'll come back to you during the Q&A session. And then, now we have our uh, final speaker for the day. Uh, we have... Uh, we have Dr. Yule Fontena. Uh, she's a research fellow from Department of Political um, and Social Sciences, University of Catania. So uh, Dr. Dr. Yule Fontena, please go ahead, floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, many thanks for hosting such a very interesting session and for inviting me to join it. It's really indeed a big pleasure. Um, so I've also prepared a um, very brief presentation. Uh, so I will now share my screen just as a, as a support for some data I would like to show. Okay, uh, can you confirm you can see that? Yes, please go ahead, yeah. Thank you. So um, 
In my intervention today, I would like to focus uh, on a non-traditional security challenge, uh, which has already been mentioned and that has definitely rised up the global and the European Union political agenda in the latest years. I'm talking of migration and large scale migratory flows. Um, so the reason why I'm focusing on, on this topic is first of all related to the fact that, uh, as it was mentioned, I'm currently a research fellow at the University of Catania in Sicily. Uh, Sicily is at the very center of the Mediterranean Sea. I will say that we are the southern border of the European Union. We are the very periphery of the European Union. And so in the previous years, we were pretty much affected by migration and large scale migratory flows. Um, so I will say that uh, as a scholar, along with my colleagues, uh, we, we had really the chance to observe very closely the dynamics behind the migration, behind the governance of migration, and also the, the major impacts and consequences for Italy, for the member states of the European Union, and for the European Union in general. And the second reason is that um, migration has been and still is today a huge a non-traditional security challenge uh, for the European Union and not only for the EU, but for the global world. In the case of the European Union, migration had a huge impact uh, on the internal balances of the EU, creating uh, cleavages among the member states. But it became also a very relevant issue, I will say, in terms of external relations of the European Union. If we think that migration has become a sort of relevant bargaining chip also in the conclusion of agreements with third countries between the the EU and, 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 and third countries. Uh, so in my presentation, I just would like to briefly sketch the situation um, from the perspective of the, um, of, of the European Union with the hope that this kind of data I might provide that could be food for thought for comparative analysis between the two regions, between EU and South Asia, where also migration and refugee crisis are also very, very relevant issues. So. Um, where we are today. So let's start with some data. Um, indeed, migration perfectly fits the definition of a non-traditional security challenge in terms of large scale and also transnational nature across different geographical routes, different geographical borders. Um, as probably you know, in the case of the EU, we had three main routes, the eastern one from Turkey to Greece, which was crossed by more than 1 million people in the latest years. The central one uh, from Libya and Tunisia to Sicily and Italy, crossed by almost 700,000 people, and the Western one uh, from Morocco to Spain. So I will say that overall, if we look at the data, uh, in the past decade, we had more than 2 million people striving to enter the EU across the Mediterranean, not to mention the increasing flows across the Western Balkans route that was crossed uh, only in 2020 by almost 27,000 people. And with COVID-19, uh, the situation did not change uh, because even if uh, uh, during uh, last year, during the lockdown um, periods in many member states, there was a reduction in terms of the number of daily arrivals in many countries, still the number of arrivals in both Italy and Spain remained quite high. And I will say they were even higher than 2019. So migration is still a relevant challenge and COVID-19 has apparently not stopped the flows toward the EU. Moreover, um, I will say that migration had also a sort of uh, a transboundary effect on the EU, meaning that it is not only uh, an issue characterized by a transnational nature crossing geographical borders, but it also had a transboundary effect spilling over different policy sectors, different policy areas. So I think that what we have witnessed in the previous years is not just a migration crisis in terms of the governance of borders or the governance of mobility or the capacity or incapacity to managing flows. But what we, we have witnessed is also a humanitarian crisis related to the high number of people dying at sea, 22,000 people so far in the Mediterranean. We also had a refugee crisis related to the high number of asylum applications received by the member states of the EU, more than 6 million. And at some point, uh, I think that we also had a crisis of asylum somehow, uh, in the sense that uh, um, 
uh, many member states, Italy included, that tried to reduce the spaces for protection, trying to reject a higher number of asylum seekers in order to reduce the number of potential refugees on their territory. And finally, we also had a political crisis in the sense that um, we know that migration was a very contested issue inside the European Union and member states some point, at some point uh, were not really able to agree on a common position. So as we can see, we have a, a tale of many crises. Uh, we have a multidimensional uh, phenomenon somehow. Um, so in order to manage with this situation, uh, both the EU and the member states have tried to implement several policy tools in terms of crisis management. But my idea is that at some point, we rapidly switched from a crisis management to a management in crisis, in the sense that it became very difficult to deal with migratory flows. And I think that the main reason behind such a crisis in, in, in management is related to the fact that we have a sort of mismatch between the very nature of migration as a non-traditional security issue and the kind of very traditional security tools that are being uh, adopted. Uh, so there is a mismatch between the nature of migration and the reality of migration patterns on the one hand and the nature of the tools adopted and the policy assumptions that are behind the tools that are being deployed by the member states. Uh, let me give you some empirical example to better illustrate what I mean by this gap. Most of the member states have implemented very traditional security means by patrolling borders, closing borders, uh, um, implementing a politics of pushbacks and also building fences and walls in, uh, at their borders just to prevent migrants from entering. The idea is that if we close borders, we will deter irregular migration. But anyway, this logic, I think, is not well posed and, and um, it ignores a very relevant aspect that is the agency of migrants, the migratory plans of migrants, their willingness to try again and again because they have no other option, or at least this is what has emerged from the interviews I had with many migrants here in Sicily. So the thing is that if we do not try to think in a new way, if we do not try to think out of the box to devise a newer solution, and if we continue just by closing the borders, we are set to be faced with a virtuous cycle. Uh, because the more we close the borders, the more this will uh, fuel uh, dangerous irregular migration, the more this will create disorder and pressure at external borders, the more this will feed populism, which will in turn call for more border closures and, and, and so on and so forth. The, the, the virtuous cycle is going to start again. Um, another thing that I would like to stress is that according to the non-traditional security uh, theoretical approaches. There is just one main way to address the non-traditional security issues, and this way is cooperation, regional governance, multilateralism. Well, in the case of the member states of the European Union, we were uh, missing most of these elements um, because inside the European Union, most of the member states were opting for unilateral solutions for not in my backyard logics. And also at the external level, I would say that we were missing a proper regional governance um, because it is true, the member states and the EU have concluded many agreements with the countries of transit and, and origin. Uh, I'm thinking about the EU-Turkey agreement, the EU-Libya, uh, the Italy-Libya agreement, but also the agreements with sub-Saharan countries. So this agreement uh, at the first stage might give the idea that we are having a regional govern governance going on in order to try to manage altogether uh, migratory flows. But anyway, most of these agreements were more um, agreements in terms of a burden shifting rather than um, a real burden sharing. Moreover, look at this data. Um, one of the logic behind these agreements with third countries is to um, use third countries as a spaces of containment in order to prevent migrants from, arri from arriving to Europe. The logic is that if we close the borders, uh, the demand for mobility will be reduced. 
However, this is not properly the case because the demand for mobility will just reorient itself. We will just look uh, at new departures points, new routes. If you look at this graph, uh, these are some of the data I have collected. You can see uh, in the first part, uh, the arrivals on the eastern route. Then the black line is the moment when the EU Turkey deal is signed. So as you can see, the arrivals on the eastern route were decreasing a lot. But however, they kept on increasing on the central Mediterranean route. Then the agreement with Libya is signed and the arrivals on the central Mediterranean route started to decrease, but they increased on the western one towards Spain. So what I'm trying to say is not that, of course, we have the automatic correlation between the routes. This is not what I'm trying to say, but what I mean is that Migration is like water. You cannot stop it. You can just deviate its course. That's the thing. So I think that um, so far the problem and the issue has been managed mainly to traditional security means, which resulted also into what I call the humanitarian vacuums, policies that are not able to capture the real nature of migration, the real humanitarian dimension of migratory processes. And this is something very relevant also related to, to what Dr. Schieber was saying at the very beginning, the variety of human security. So when we're dealing with migration, whose security are we talking of? Is just security of borders or also security of people? And if, and if this is the case, whose people? So uh, the thing is that so far, this kind of policies were not only unable to stop migration, but they were somehow co-producing the vulnerability of the people on the move, increasing the, the risk for their human security. Um, so just to, to conclude, I think that uh, we are faced with two main uh, things. The first is this mismatch between the nature, the non-traditional character of migration on the one hand, and the traditional character of the tools that are being adopted to manage the phenomenon. That's the first thing. The second thing is that uh, there is this general perception uh, uh, among member states, but more generally among countries around the world, that migration is a very short term phenomenon. There is this idea that migration is just a set of waves. So moments of upstreams that are characterized by exogenous shocks. But I would rather say that migration is not made up of waves. Migration is a tide, is a constant phenomenon. It's, it's a new normal. So it's something that, that we cannot treat just with the traditional security means or just in an, an emergential approach. But we need more long-term solution. Uh, we need to think out of, the, uh, out of the box in a different way. And this is also what Emma was suggesting in her presentation when stressing that also climate change keeps on being treated with very traditional means and that we need to devise new ways and new forms of, of global cooperation. Because if we don't proceed like that, the result is that migration crises are set to travel back to the future because we are going to have a vicious cycle of border closures, migratory flows, humanitarian vacuums that are being reproposed over time from one border to another, from one continent to another, from one crisis to the next. And just one, two final remarks. Um, my perception is that um, probably because of this very pretty much securitized approach by the member states uh, uh, in, in Europe, uh, there is also this uh, tendency to stress a lot the relevance uh, of uh, readmission agreement and return agreement with third countries. I think uh, this was a very important aspect uh, stressed also in the recent relations between the EU and certain Asian countries, if we think about uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Bangladesh. Um, so uh, what I wonder, first of all, is uh, um, what is the room for cooperation between these two regions? Uh, is there any room in future, in the future, for a cooperation between the EU and SARC in order to, to better manage migration, especially given the fact that migration and refugee crises are indeed also a big issue in, in South Asia? And also, um, I was wondering whether we can also develop a, 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 some comparative analysis in order to better understand in which way migration is managed in, in these two different regions of, of, the, of the world. So these are just uh, open questions.
question for, for, for further research. But indeed, uh, what I'm trying to stress is that uh, as a non-traditional security issue, uh, it is a global problem and we need the global solution based on cooperation across regions, across countries around the world. And uh, I'll stop here and, and thank you. Thank you for, for, for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Fontana, for that uh, interesting presentation. And um, uh, you were very correct when you highlighted about uh, resolving or trying to resolve the non-traditional uh, security issues through traditional methods. That definitely is not going to work because the contemporary problems require out-of-the-box thinking and new approaches in terms of resolving these issues. And uh, I think we all remember those uh, those pictures where these migrants were actually dying, uh, the pictures of them dying on their way in, in, the, in the sea, in the boats. And that, that, was, that actually stayed with us for a very long time, those disturbing pictures. And if we do not resolve these problems right now, obviously they are going to increase in terms of these people knocking at different countries, uh, boundaries and maybe even resulting in some kind of further conflict uh, among and between nations and different communities. So I think it's very critical that we need to take a strong approach and resolve these problems right now. And of course, when we talk about migration, then this pertinent issue actually, again, we go back to, as you highlighted, the regional coordination and regional approach to such a problem. Because um, since I've been working on European Union and ASEAN and STAR for decades now my, in terms of comparative studies. So I, I remember that uh, it's very critical because European Union has done extremely well as a regional security organization. Uh, but the, the one important point that still needs to work on is in terms of having a common approach to certain issues in terms of common security and, and foreign policy. And now when we talk about security, then it is a very, very wide dimension in terms of humanitarian approach, in terms of human security. So uh, that's very critical. So this is a very pertinent point that you highlighted. And of course, I think when we talk about uh, regional effective governance or human resilience or even preparations, preparations both in terms of disaster management and such uh, problems in future, it requires a kind of a cru crucial cooperation, both at rather at the three different levels, which I just suggested earlier also, national, regional, and the global level. So I think in order to deal with these uh, pressing challenges, more commitment, uh, more kind of a coordination and cooperation among different stakeholders, and also uh, cooperation going beyond the region in terms of perhaps, as you suggested, European Union and South Asia, can also work on these issues. Um, it can be dialogue mechanism or it can be exchange of experiences and expertise. So I think this is the way to look forward and a way forward. So once again, thank you for that interesting presentation. Uh, well, I think, yeah. The floor is open now for the Q&A session. I think I request all our participants if they can write their questions in the chat box uh, for all of us to have a look or uh, even in the Q&A, uh, you can go ahead and do that. Okay, uh, do, have, do we have certain questions uh, here, Mr. Mr. Shyam? Um, uh, no, ma'am, oh, we haven't received any, but okay, what we can fine. do is we can have like, yeah, I'll do that. Like, I think, or, yeah. Or yeah. Sure, sure. Uh, well, it, we're just waiting for the questions from our participants. I'm sure it has been such a wonderful session. There will be certain questions. But just to take our discussion forward, um, I think all of us um, um, on this platform, we, we shared uh, one very critical approach, uh, which all of us, we may have spoken about climate change or migration or cyber security or in terms of uh, Northeast India or India, Nepal or South Asia. Uh, but one thing that, that comes to the fore that uh, it has to be a comprehensive security going beyond the traditional to the comprehensive human security element, you know, uh, which is humanitarian uh, on based on the human values. So uh, my question would be for all the panelists to ponder upon and perhaps share their views when we talk about human values, 
when we talk about a humanitarian approach, um, are we talking about only the non-conventional issues or somewhere down the line, we are also talking about the military aspect or the political security, uh, or rather if I rephrase my question, do you believe that political and military security will always be there? Uh, these issues will always be there and non-traditional issues are, are kind of an extension of these issues? Or do you believe that non-traditional security issues have taken preeminence over the traditional security issues? So perhaps if all the panelists would like to share their views on this. Uh, perhaps we can uh, we can start with uh, Sabesachi. Would you like to, uh, if you go in that order as as you presented your paper, Mr. Datta, would you like to share your views, or any other panelists would like to? You're talking to me. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Fontana. Oh. Please do that. Yeah, please. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, um, I think you raised a very relevant point in the sense that uh, um, also getting back to what you were saying uh, at the very beginning, we are making this distinction, traditional versus non-traditional, but you're perfectly right when you say that they are actually perfectly interwined. And, and we can see that this is also what I was trying to stress in, in the presentation. Migration may um, uh, be depicted uh, at the first site as a non-traditional security issue, but it has a lot of implication also for traditional security issues, as you were also mentioning. And we have seen that also if we uh, reflect about political security, political stability. In the European Union, we had a huge impact of migration going beyond the mere management of flows, but there was an impact also at the level of relations of the member states, at the level also of the interinstitutional relations. Uh, if we think about the, the, the wrestling, uh, harm wing um, between the European Commission and, and, and the European Council also in terms to define a common strategy. So um, I think that uh, these are two things that uh, are not set to be uh, clearly separated. We can do that analytically speaking as scholars, of course, to explore them, but in empirical reality, uh, they are pretty much uh, interwined. Maybe the real problem is the very fact that even if they are interwined, uh, when we deal with non-traditional security issue, there is this prevalence to use uh, just traditional security means. So we should uh, try to combine the two things. So, okay, in the case of migration, if we want to close borders and I can get why some states try to adopt this approach, then we do, we do not have to forget the other side of the coin. So that there is also a, a humanitarian dimension, a more comprehensive dimension of security where the state, where the border is not just the only referent object of security, but we have also different and reference objects of security, starting from people, starting, starting from migrants, starting from people on the move. So I think the two things are said to be interwined. The next step is how to, uh, let's say, translate these uh, interwined character in terms of policy tools, so proper policy tools that can get this complex nature. Well, um, thank you, Fontana. Uh, well, Emma, would you like to add something to that? Yes, thank you. Um, I actually don't have a lot to add to that. I think that's a very, very good uh, sort of intervention. Um, maybe only to the, the question, because I think you also asked whether we think that these sort of traditional security threats or traditional security will in some way uh, maybe lose its, um, its meaning or, or kind of its uh, relevance. I don't think that that will actually happen. I, I think that um, that there are always going to be, unfortunately, wars and, and things like that, which are more in the in the very traditional security field. Uh, but I do think that, uh, like Yula kind of said, that um, that these two, uh, the traditional and non-traditional uh, elements, are going to be more and more intertwined, and uh, and maybe there can also be some some sort of. Uh, uh, kind of overlaps in the, in the responses to them um, and actually also in the climate uh, climate security field I know that that many for example the, the US uh, military has been a very active uh, um, developer of, of different kinds of climate security responses so I, I think that this will be somehow 
overlapping, uh, but I hope that it will mean that increasingly the non-traditional security threats will still be taken kind of as seriously as the as the traditional ones and that that there will be in a way room on the agenda for both approaches i guess thank you emma uh, samir would you like to share your views i agree with both the panelists in fact uh, politics of security and securitization are really uh, some of the contested themes which we face within this uh, security studies domain but i also feel that uh, the moment you attach the term security to some of the emerging non conventional concerns the approach to solve, resolve these issues in a sense gets restricted and because obviously because of the fact that uh, the security establishment to begin with has a very restricted view of looking at because they are about the scope they managed to other than resolve the issue uh, that can work in the traditional security domain but in the non conventional security domain you don't need to manage the issue you need to actually resolve uh the 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 ever pressing concerns so in that sense i think i would say you know that attaching the term security to some of these new emerging uh, 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 concerns is uh, some, somewhat problematic however uh, if you look at from the other point of view actually if you attach the term security then that just elevates the the the, the attention that policy makers are able to give to some of these issues and in a sense if uh, in, in a sense the policy makers can actually press those issues within the government hierarchy and the government machinery to make them aware to make it aware that you know, that this is the issue which actually deserves some kind of a policy priority over some of the other issues which do not carry the term security uh, with them so and i would say you know that uh, even though it is problematic i would say we, I mean, we can still go with the, the attaching the term to security some of the uh, emerging concerns thank you sami um, okay uh, see when we talk about european union and and south asia or or sark or uh, beamstack or bbin we are talking about certain organizations so that is what when governments to governments the re, at the regional level or the regional organizations they interact with each other the second is what we call track two and three kind of a diplomacy where you have non state actors working together in terms of collaboration and cooperation so in terms of um, european union and uh, south asia uh, which approach do you think will be better in terms of a more comprehensive kind of a collaboration because i believe we have not explored uh, fully our 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 actual we can collaborate in many more areas we have not explored fully our full potential so it's very critical that we actually explore our full potential both at the level of uh, south asia and the european union uh, so that is one and the other approach is kind of a uh, track to where you think that beyond the actual regional organizations people uh, to people contact can be enhanced and that can actually uh, uh, help in further collaboration and cooperation so which approach do you think or rather you believe that both should go hand in hand so your take on that again i think we can start with yole we can start with you Yes, thank you. Um, yes, I, I totally agree with you in in rising up the role of non-state actors and in stressing the relevance of having a multi-level cooperation. So not just uh, at the intergovernmental level, uh, but also on the ground. And and I totally agree with that because if I look at this from the point of view of migration as a non-traditional security challenge, I have to say that non-state actors. Uh, do really have a huge role in managing uh, migratory flows on the ground. This is something that we have seen here in Sicily as well, where a lot of non-state organization and, and even simple citizens were extremely active in order to manage migrants arriving on the ground. And, um, and I think this is a very relevant point. Probably um, the next step would be uh, to improve the tables of cooperation between these two different categories of actor, because the some of the things that are often reported by non-state actors on the ground when dealing with migration is the lack of coordination with institutional actors, with governmental actors. So, so at some point, there is a sort of cleavage. We might have governmental actors doing something and, and the non-state actors doing something different. And this is also why uh, there are some, some, some colleagues of mine define the migration, especially here in Italy, as a sort of dynamic battleground 
because we can have these different actors cooperating, but sometimes also competing on the ground. So I think uh, non-state actors have a precious role, especially non-traditional security issues. So the next step would be to try to implement a real multi-level governance. So and, and, and trying to implement real tables of cooperation involving different actors, also because non-state actors can provide really different perspectives and can really be a huge asset, especially when, when trying to discuss about this issue at, at the intergovernmental level. Thank you. Uh, thank you for sharing your views. Emma, would you like to? Yeah, just shortly, uh, again, kind of echoing Yule here, but uh, I think also in the uh, climate change field, you, you really see that um, even though maybe the, the problems in a way are, are often acknowledged also by the, the sort of uh, more traditional and, and kind of like, like the high level political actors, but then when it comes to the solutions in a way on the ground of what should be done, then of course the, the best knowledge is, uh, is with the non-state actors and, and with the um, NGOs and so on. And often they just don't really have any, any access to, to these um, higher level political tables in a way uh, where they could share their, their ideas. So in that sense, I think it's, it's very important when you are actually trying to come up with some, some solutions and some practices and measures in order to, to tackle uh, climate security and clearly also migration and other, other non-traditional security threats. Um, it is very important to to include all of these tracks in a way then and also in this like for example eu uh, south asia cooperation i think it's it's really a must uh, thank you emma uh, samir would you like to add something so i mean uh, i don't have any experience with the other security fields but looking at i think the cyber security by nature, if you look at the, 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 the phenomenon of internet, it is actually a multi-stakeholder model. There are governments, there are technology companies, there are civil society activists, uh, human rights activists, and there are the, the common internet users. So in that sense, I would say, you know, uh, it is very important that, uh, uh, very important to actually include the, the, the so-called non-state actors into, this, uh, into the process. And because that is how only when you can actually resolve some of the problems associated with cybersecurity. Because if the states take an action, at the best, that state, uh, that action will be only partial answer to resolving uh, some of these issues. And uh, if you look at, for instance, the 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 ICAN, the body which actually manages the entire infrastructure of the internet, you know, when the United States handed over the control of that body uh, from its uh, from its control to the to the international community, it actually also so went ahead with a multi-stakeholder model because it because in the sense that reflected the the, 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 the the character of the internet that if the states are given the opportunity to manage that infrastructure and the entire resource, you know, states will bring their own vision, but that may not align with the visions of other actors, which also have a very important say in the in the management of that particular infrastructure. So I would say at least in the cybersecurity domain, it makes sense to include some of these non-state actors in the management of the issue. Thank you, Sabi. Uh, well, Sabi Sachi, would you like to add something to that? Um, Since you're traveling, so I think it may be a little difficult for you, but uh, if you like to, you have a final yeah. comment. Yeah. Yeah, 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 just, uh, you know, I think as this is an academic discussion between think tanks, I would really suggest that we develop a different uh, uh, set of, uh, you know, uh, uh, naming and uh, uh, definitions. For example, I think the line between security threat and, uh, and, and and traditional security is very much in a flux. What is traditional and what is non-traditional? Similarly, in today's world, um, the role of non-state actors uh, and government actors. I mean, uh, if if there is a non-state actor. Uh, there are people, non-state actors who are working with the state and against the state. So, you know, I think we need to develop uh, develop some new nomenclature uh, for for the challenges that we face uh, for the future. Um, this would be my uh, my my uh, my uh, my suggestion for for the coming uh, 
years for the academics. <laughs> Thank you, Sabri Sachi. Well, uh, that was a wonderful discussion. Any of the panelists, would you like to uh, say something or add your final comments or add anything to uh, the discussion that we just had? Okay, fine. So, uh, well, uh, I think that was absolutely a wonderful discussion. I And I'm sure our audience and participants, uh, participants they have also enjoyed as much as I enjoyed uh, moderating this session with our uh, eminent panelists. And I would say that the whole approach, which, which was called the 3D approach, uh, which talks about development, diplomacy, and defense. And when we talk about defense, it does include security, human security, uh, in addition to the military and political security. So this 3D uh, approach uh, to security um, is very critical and relevant. And perhaps we can even go beyond that in terms of dealing with the uh, non-traditional and traditional security issues, which does intertwine at uh, different levels of government. And also uh, when we talk about the issues, the non-traditional security issues, when we talk about concerns like demographic shifts or pandemic, uh, which we are going through in the present time. So the migration, uh, cyber warfare, uh, environmental issues, human security issues, or as we call the food security. So all these uh, issues actually call for uh, a multi-dimensional approach uh, in terms of um, uh, collaboration and learning from each other, networking, uh, kind of a give and take uh, in terms of sharing technology, sharing expertise. And I think in this area, um, European Union and South Asia, they can definitely uh, come together in order to make the world a better place uh, for everyone, uh, for our future generations, for ourselves, uh, in order to have enhanced security, not only in traditional terms, in terms of political military, but also in non-traditional terms, which we call a humanitarian approach or a human security. So I think uh, with that, uh, once again, I would, uh, before I call um, Mr. Sunil Casey for his closing remarks, I thank my wonderful panelists, our wonderful audience uh, for this session. And it has been absolutely a pleasure. And of course, I congratulate uh, both the organizing, uh, you know, organizing team, uh, which is both from the uh, Nepal and also from Brussels especially Mr. Uh, Sunil Casey and Mr. Sham Casey for organizing this very, very important and uh, very, very topical uh, summit on European Union and South Asia. So thank you organizers and congratulations to you. Now with those uh, remarks, I would uh, like to call upon Mr. Uh, Sunil Casey for his closing remarks. Mr. Sunil Casey is the founder and CEO of uh, Asian Institute of Diplomacy and International Affairs. Over to you, Mr. Sunil Casey. Thank you. Namaste and uh, good morning, good afternoon and good evening. First, I would like to thank uh, our partner institute, South Asia Democratic Forum, SADF, for this great partnership for successfully hosting this summit. Especially, I would like to thank Mr. Paulo Kasaka, founder and ED of SADF, for accepting our proposal to jointly host this summit, which I believe added the greater value to our ongoing partnership. Similarly, I, I also like to thank Dr. Sifrit Ov for his great collaboration and expert guidance. And at our end, I would like to thank Mr. Sham Kesi, Research and Development Director for conceptualizing and thematic sessions and working hardly to bring distinguished experts together in this summit. Most importantly, I extend my sincere thanks to all the distinguished speakers for your valuable insights and experiences at this two-day EU SAR Think Tank Summit and contributing in under the theme of advancing EU SAR cooperation. We aimed at promoting constructive institutional collaboration, advancing inter-regional economic cooperation, understanding regional strategies of the EU in South Asia, analyzing the underlying challenges of regional integration, examining the role of EU in promoting development and democracy in South Asia, and also building cooperation to combat with common non-traditional security challenges. We believe uh, the critical and expert views on those areas have immensely contributing to accomplish aims of this EU-South Asia uh, think tank summit. 
we would like to express our sincere gratitude to Her Excellency Nuna Defres, Ambassador of the European Union to Nepal and His Excellency Ugo, Ambassador of the European Union to India and Bhutan for th their gracious presence. Along with the long-term policy impact, we always try to ensure and create the immediate and important links between policy scholars and implementing agencies. We feel that their presence contributed to achieving this goal. We would also like to thank permanent think tanks and universities from both the regions, which includes University of Catania from Italy, Finnish Institute of International Affairs, Australian Institute for European and Security Policy, Center for International Relations, and the University of Warsaw from Poland, German Institute for International and Security Affairs, German Marshall Fund of the United States, and the Center for European Policy Studies from Belgium Policy Research Institute from Nepal. Also, Pakistan Institute of International Affairs and Bangladesh Institute of Development Studies, also King's College of London. Similarly, from India, Manohar Parikar Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis. We become the International Foundation from Delhi, Asian Confluence from India, the University of Delhi, send the same platform for sending their perspectives and frank access of the ideas on mutual issues and opportunity. It's truly really extraordinary. I believe this wider participation itself supported in promoting networks and collaboration between think tanks from the two regions, which is one of the aims of this summit. Let us work together to promote our constructive engagements and innovative partnerships to advance the interregional cooperation. We hope to increase the participation and explore new dimension of EU-South Asia relations in our second edition of the summit in 2022. And I hope that the event will be physically. Let us hope for that. And I wish stay safe to everyone. Thank you once again for your partnership, for making this event successful. Thank you. Thank you.